Uh, hi, everybody. And again, thanks ever so much for joining us. We have here Rob, our Head of Technology and EdTech Design, and uh, Julio as well, which is our resident in-house language uh, tutor, as well as an experienced video and filmmaker. And myself, Dave Page, work, works for FilmDo. And uh, yeah, thanks ever so much for joining us on this round, uh, round table chat and also webinar as well. Firstly, I just want to point out that um, this isn't a sales opportunity and our tool is currently free to use anyway due to COVID. Uh, we've made this um, software free for 2020. But uh, before we do actually start, I just want to share with you. Uh, 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 just some house rules and agenda. Can you guys see all that? Julio, Rob? Yeah, perfect. Yep. Right. Okay, so I'll do a very brief introduction of FilmDo and how we came about with the FilmDo Academy and the tool that we've got. Rob will speak about our EdTech platform and show you exactly how it, it can be used and you guys can use it as well. And then uh, Julio as well will talk about his own experience and user case and we'll open up the floor to the Q&A and roundtable discussion. Perfect. So um, just coming on to what I said there about this, this, I don't want this, this isn't, the point isn't to be salesy and anyone that signs up to our platform will not be bombarded with spam. We don't take credit card or debit detail. So why are we here? Um, children are consuming and learning video uh, using content out of choice. We believe we've created the perfect tool to assist with tutors and teachers uh, um, uh, using video content for classes. This is a way of letting people like you guys know that we're here. Film Do Academy is here. Our software that we created enables the tutor to create a class with the help of film video content and adding interactions where it makes it possible for students to play along and answer the questions set. Using video in this way keeps the students interested and motivated and also shows them how the words are pronounced and used with dialect. Overall, it makes learning language um, a fun experience. So just a bit about the background of who we are. FilmDo started as a global online film streaming platform and we helped audience find and watch films that don't really get the recognition they deserve getting overshadowed by mainstream Western platforms and titles, no names mentioned. Um, we have a huge database of international films now covering 83 countries and 35 languages delivered on our diverse curated platform, which is filmdo.com. In fact, what I'll do right now is I'll just actually share that just in case any of you guys actually haven't seen it. Uh, 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 and there it is. This is our platform where all of our films are curated by category, by language. Um, this means as well that we're perfectly positioned to be able to bring a groundbreaking new way of learning a language, which um, is with our interactive tool using film. We've created a dedicated platform where tutors can build a course and language learners can play along in their own time with our demo games. And uh, I won't actually show you that website. I'm sure that Rob's going to show us that right now. So I'm going to hand over to Rob. So Rob, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Dave. I'm just going to share my screen, assuming I have some kind of permission to. And you should now have my screen in your view. Um, so I'm going to talk you through how to use this platform to set up some interactions you can use in your classrooms. Um, and how you could share those. But before I do, I prepared a couple of slides to just start talking, to start the discussion really, because after this, we're gonna have a round, round table discussion about teaching and some of the problems you're facing. And we wanna learn a lot from you. And I thought I'm gonna ask some provocative questions and give some interesting things to think about before we get into that. And some of it's gonna lead into the philosophy of why we've created this. So very quickly, like, less than 10 minutes, I'm gonna talk you through a couple of slides about, about sort of our, our thinking behind this sort of stuff. And I wanna really start with a question because this is a question that we had last week and I don't think we have a satisfying answer to it. So this is a great thing for us to lead into the, the round table a little later because I would love to hear your response. That was, how do we measure engagement? 
And I think that's really interesting now that we're all online talking via these Zoom calls, because if I was in a room with you all now, I reckon holistically I can read the room a little bit and I can spot who's on their phone because they need to be and who's on their phone because I'm boring them. And then I can adjust my lesson a little to, to kind of meet that. But it's also interesting because we're in a place between education and technology, we're in ed tech. And one thing I noticed is that the word engagement means completely different things to these two groups of people. And that's interesting when we're talking about language teaching specifically, because we love the idea that maybe a word just has one meaning, but I don't think this does at all. Because when a tech company talks about engagement, they're talking about how many times someone clicked a link and how many times they shared it and how many times they clicked like on something. Things which tell us very little about how engaged someone was with that content. In fact, uh, it's, almost, uh, it's almost a business practice for people to write blogs that are so mind-numbingly boring that you drift off and go and click on the ads at the side or you, you click and open up a different article because you're so bored of it. But yet you would have pretty good engagement metrics despite the fact it wasn't engaging. So the first thing that's really interesting is that actually when a tech company talks about engagement, it's not the same as when a teacher talks about engagement. They're completely different things to those two different groups of people. So it's really interesting for us to hear from teachers directly how they would tell if something was engaging or not. But there's also the fact that when tech companies measure uh, anything, they do it in a very short term kind of way. So I personally think stories are really engaging. and I'm going to get to why in a moment. But I've got a story about when I first started teaching that shows the difference between a teacher and a tech company. And that is that like the very first Friday when I was teaching classes, I went to class and I took a big bag of lollies with me to each of my classes. And I said to my students, everyone who's done their homework, I'm gonna give you a lolly for doing your homework. And then of course, I didn't wanna let anyone out. So anyone who hadn't done their homework just had to do a different task so that they get a lolly. And then of course, Monday comes around and every single student's done their homework, of course. And they all come to me and they say, teacher, I've done my homework, where's my lolly? Which of course I didn't have. <laughs> but if I was measuring super short term metrics like tech companies tend to do, I would say, oh look, giving students lollipops means they do their homework more, therefore that's a good thing to do. And of course, every teacher knows that rewards don't work as does every manager and every parent and really anyone who deals with people, but tech companies don't seem to get that. And of course, I didn't give them lollies every single day for doing their homework from then on. But even if I had, they'd finally grow bored of lollies and that wouldn't work. And the other problem is they would then have a certain level of cognitive dissonance in their brains where they're not doing their homework to get into university or to make their parents proud or just for the joy of learning anymore. Now they're doing it for lollipops and which one's going to win out. But it's also still totally measuring the wrong thing because the question isn't does your student do their homework or not? It's do they do it well? Do they engage with the homework? We do, we're better off having one student who does their homework and really learn something than 100% who do it uh, really badly, quickly before class. And I can tell you, not from data, but from firsthand experience, that when students are doing it just to get their lollipops, they don't do good homework. <laughs> and just a very, very specific version of this point about, about how tech companies measure very short-term data Every EdTech product I've ever seen has one of these, a progress bar. And that's because in the short term, this looks really, really useful. Uh, people love seeing things completed. They love working towards completion. So they see a progress bar and it completes. And then they go, that is brilliant. My students are clearly uh, engaged. They're clearly learning a lot or, or something like that. But the problem with the progress bar is the very reason we enjoy seeing it completed is because we then don't need to keep hold of the information that we needed to do that task. It's something called the Zagornik effect. It was a, a Russian uh, lady who was watching people in a cafe and she noticed that the waiters will remember everything from everyone's order in the whole cafe until they've paid their bills. And the second they've paid up the bill, they will forget everything about that person, what they looked like, what they ordered, everything, because the task was completed. So having something complete actually makes us forget things straight away. It's really bad seeing things complete. Probably the worst thing for education is handing someone a degree and saying, you're done with education now. The word complete <laughs> is really bad for education. And yet every ed tech product in the world has a progress bar 
which says you've now completed module two, well done. And it's because tech companies measure really, really short term things. They measure, did the student do their homework this week? Whereas they should be measuring, did it improve long term ongoing, which is much, much harder. And as a teacher in a classroom, you holistically learn those things. And we all know that if you see a teacher going to classroom with a bag of lollipops, they're very new to teaching. <laughs> they're going to have a very hard time. So big differences here. Uh, tech companies use different language for the word engagement. They measure much more short term data to decide if it's winning or not. And uh, this is this is another example of a tech company that I think got it completely wrong. This is a, a US company called BrainCo, and they've made EEG sensors, which are potentially quite useful on their own. You can wear these to see how focused your thoughts are. But they tried this out in a school in China last year, and the school finally abandoned this idea because they didn't like their data uh, getting out there. But the students each would wear an EEG sensor with a light on the front, and then the teacher can see it turn from green to red if they lose focus. And then their parents can see a readout for the day and all this sort of stuff. So they know if a student's not focusing. Now, the, the first obvious problem with this is the EEG sensors are really inaccurate. And if you just pick up the bad headset, you're going to be grounded that weekend, even though it wasn't your fault. And, and they haven't been collaborated recently. There's going to be some other problems. But the other thing is that that these headsets aren't measuring engagement either. They're measuring focus, which isn't really interesting to us. In fact, for learning, we need both. Uh, some of you have probably seen Professor Barbara Oakley. She's written the book, uh, A Mind for Numbers, and she's got the best-selling course in any subject online, which is learning how to learn on Coursera. Uh, but she's also very well explained these two different types of thinking, focused thinking and diffuse thinking. And she's got this great example with a pinball table where focused thinking is when your brain bounces around a very small, very specific part of your brain when you need focused thinking. And diffuse thinking is where you are making bizarre connections across neurons in all different parts of your brain and it's bouncing around the place. Now, psychologists call this system one and system two thinking. Neuroscientists call this uh, your central executive network and your default mode network. Uh, but she calls it focused and diffuse thinking, which I think are, are quite nice. And I think we can kind of relate to these two things. Now, the problem with a student who sat there focused for an entire hour is they don't learn much. Focus is very good for doing a task. A task might be assimilate this one thing into your brain, but once it's in there, you need to stop and you need to daydream for a minute. You need some kind of diffuse thinking time which is why we come up with good ideas in the shower or when we go for a walk, because that's when our brain is making new connections. And when we are trying to learn something, it's all about novel neural connections, especially our language, because it's so illogical, right? <laughs> so we ideally need people to be unfocused for part of a class. They need to stop, daydream, do some different activities so that they can have these bounce around in their brain. And actually something like emotion is really, really valuable because um, uh, emotions use light up such large areas of our brain. This is some brain scans of people watching a movie. And if the same thing happens if you read a story to someone. If somebody is watching a movie, they genuinely feel the emotions of the characters on the screen. People see a stressful situation and it actually gives them cortisol yeah, they actually feel stress themselves and they see a joyful uh, experience and they actually get oxytocin. They actually feel more empathy for the person. This weird thing where we watch a film or hear a story where it hijacks our brain and we actually feel the same things as the character. Now, I would say that's a good measurement of engagement. I would say that's proof that stories are engaging because we can see the person literally following along with the characters in the story. Now, further to this, there's this guy called Steve Krashen, who uh, back in the, I'm going to say 1970s in New York, he noticed that the people who learned language the fastest weren't actually people going to language classes, but they were just people who got a lot of input. And he had this theory and did some tests around how you can learn a language with just input, just input alone, not going to a class, just listen to the radio and watching movies and that kind of stuff. And whilst some people agree with him. I don't think we can agree completely, especially because 
we've probably learned a lot about teaching in the last 50 years and maybe his experiments don't still hold up. But the other problem that I think is if you are just watching films, despite the fact that it's like the most engaging thing your brain can do, which is brilliant for learning, brilliant, especially for something like diffuse thinking where we, we, we want to be in that state of mind for learning a language. Uh, and that kind of input is possibly one of the best things you can do to learn a language. We also need to think about some of the downsides, like why do ed tech companies keep putting those progress bars in? It's because we get a little dopamine and we feel like we're progressing even if we aren't. The amount of people we spoke to who use Duolingo and learn absolutely nothing, but still use it because they like getting the little buzz every day, get their little dopamine hits because they think they've learned something, which you don't get with a movie. Actually, it feels kind of stressful because it's hard to follow a foreign language film, even if it's the most useful thing you can be doing. So our philosophy at FilmDo really is that what about if we couple the thing that's best for language learners with the thing they want to do? What about if we add those kind of Duolingo style interactions in throughout a film so they get this direct contextual input that Steve Krashen says is the best thing for learning, but they regularly get dopamine hits too so that they feel like they're learning whilst they actually are learning. So, that's my little introduction to some of our philosophy and our thinking, and I've got a few slides there. And we're gonna go to a round table in a minute. I would love to hear some of your thoughts on some of this stuff. I would love especially to hear you disagree with some things I've said, because this is some of the philosophy <laughs> we're taking forward for our designs. Uh, now, before we do that though, I'm just gonna demo this product that we've got. And if you go to filmdo.academy, you can come here and try it out yourself tomorrow. And I'm just gonna really quickly talk you through how to use this. This is very much a, a beta version at the moment. As Dave said, you can currently come here and use it for free and we are massively developing this out at the moment. So it's gonna have lots more features soon. Now, if I click on sign in in the top right, um, I can click create account here and that's gonna let me create a new account straight away. So I'm just gonna write Robert Film Do and I, I don't think there's currently an account associated with that. It's gonna choose me a username, but that's perhaps a little bit too, uh, too generic and that's probably already taken. And I'm gonna choose a password and that's created me an account. It's also taken me straight to this page, filmdo.academy slash FD hyphen Rob, which is, or underscore Rob, which is my new username. And at any point I can click my courses and come back here. What you'll notice is there's nothing on this page right now. Sorry. There's nothing on that page right now. Uh, and that's because I haven't created any courses yet. Now, a course is going to basically be a video with questions over it, a film with questions over it, and the students are going to watch it together and answer questions. I'll show you exactly what I mean in a second, but first I'm going to create it and then we can see it in action. Now, uh, if I click create new, I'm going to get a video from YouTube and I've chosen a short Spanish film right here, reasonably at random. Uh, and I'm going to paste that into this box. Now, FilmDo is a video on demand platform with a massive collection of foreign language films. But currently, we're using free films from YouTube because we are giving you access to this tool for free. And we don't uh, currently have, we don't currently want to be paying all the content makers for using their film whilst they're using a free tool. Uh, we'll also be adding some features to help you find the content that's useful to your level, has the certain grammar points in that you need. But for now, you're going to have to search YouTube yourself. Now, once I put that URL in there, it's going to take me to this screen here. And I'm going to skip this walkthrough because I'm going to walk you through right now, but you can watch that yourself later. And if I click cut video in the top left here, I can drag out the start and end time so that I can just use a section of the film. Maybe I don't need the whole thing. Maybe I'm going to set a different section for homework later. Uh, maybe we're going to watch it over a couple of classes. So I'm just going to choose this six minute section here. And then I can click edit questions, this tab at the top here. And this is going to let me uh, any place where I'm watching the video, I'm going to be able to stop it and hit add a question. And it's going to bring up this little authoring screen where I can write in my question straight into the screen. Just write question one there. Answers A and B. Obviously, in reality, I'd be a little bit more imaginative with the questions I'm asking. And I'm going to select uh, question A to be the correct answer. And, and I can now continue. And you'll see I've got a little orange line on the, the play bar here. So I can come back and edit this question when I want. Maybe I realized it came a little bit too 
soon so I can change the time there. Just move the question back for a second. Maybe the question's not on screen for long enough when the students are playing the game, so I'm going to make it last for 20 seconds instead. Now, we have experimented with some different interactions that the students can get when they are working through these videos themselves. For now, we've kept it real simple and just put minim, um, multiple choice questions in there. And the reason is because it works really well with their existing mental models. You don't have to explain too much to your students uh, the first time you play. They understand getting a multiple choice question on their screen, but we're also toying with maybe there's an open-ended question and they type it out and then see each other's responses. Maybe there's drag and drop and, and fill in the blanks and, and different kinds of discussions, all sorts of different interactions we can add. And we'd love to hear your, your suggestions for that. So I can add as many questions as I want in here and I can click save and that's going to take me back to this screen, which is for some reason not loading. Um, I'm just gonna show you a different page because my new page is not working. And that would take you to a screen like this with all, all my kind of classes on it that I created, um, uh, which would allow me to then go in straight in to, to play a game. So if I was in a classroom with some students right now, I could click play now on this first video and it's gonna give me a QR code. Now we could play along, but we, we're only on this call for so long and I'd much rather hear uh, your thoughts. So I'm just gonna separate out a browser window to pretend that this is a student's iPad or their own computer or uh, phone even. I put this URL in here. And this is gonna let the student join the room. I'm gonna call myself Rob, very imaginative there. And it, you'll see it's added a little emoji to my teacher's screen and a little zombie face. It's assigned me randomly uh, an emoji. One of the things we've noticed is students' absolute favorite thing is coming up with a funny nickname and uh, getting a weird emoji. So of course they have to get this. And I've currently got zero points and I can see that I'm watching the same video as my teacher. Now we could have 10, 20, 30 students all join and we'd see them all join here. But for now, we've got one screen for the student and one for the teacher. So just uh, use your imagination slightly for a second. Imagine the right side of my screen is a student's phone and the left side is a student, a teacher's projector. When I click let's play, and I'm just gonna turn it down into um, mute mode, you'll see a progress bar working, not the progress bar like I talked about earlier, working its way across the back of the screen there, and then uh, a question appear on the student's screen when it pauses, and they can click that for a few points. Now I got zero points, so, um, we didn't see me in the leaderboard there, but we'd also see a leaderboard of the top three students um, if I'd actually got the question right. Um, now, we think this is really great because now the students are all sat watching a video, which we know is super helpful, but they're not getting frustrated and they're not drifting off. And every single student in the class is following along, waiting for that next question because they like the competitive element, but it's not stressful. In fact, the points are done in a way where they don't always it's not always the smartest student who wins we want it to be more like a game than a test and we've got plenty of different gaming mechanisms we want to try and fit into this because as soon as the student sees it as a test as steve crash and himself said in that slide i just showed you the quote of uh, then they're not going to be learning as well we want them to feel like they're playing a game regardless of the fact that when i get to the end of the video um just answer this last question. When we get to the end of the video, you'll see that on my student screen, I've actually got a little bit of feedback of which questions I answered right and wrong and what the correct answer were, and also what percentage of other students answered that right and wrong. And I can also now download a uh, CSV file, a Excel spreadsheet of all the students. The teacher can download all the students' results. So they can see if maybe one question was too hard or if one student's not following along. And actually one way we've seen teachers use this is considering the questions are there kind of for an attention spike and to keep the students involved, occasionally just throwing a question in which isn't even that related to the video, but is actually because the teacher wants to use it as a knowledge check to make sure that they are where they're supposed to be in the, the current module. So really in a nutshell, that is our, our new tool, the beta version of our new tool that you can come use absolutely for free. So we'd love to let you know about filmdo.academy and you can come here 
create a new account, create your own um, courses, and you can share them with other teachers as well. Because once I open this up, you'll see I get a hash and the URL. This URL here is now always going to lead back to this same course. So I can share this exact class course with any other teacher, post it to them, put it on social media if I want, uh, and they can just pick it up and start using it. Great so I'm going to ha hand over back to you then, Dave. Yeah, thanks ever so much. That was brilliant. Well done, Rob. Thank you, Rob. I need a round of applause button. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice, thanks, fantastic. Yes. Um, I forgot to say as well, guys, if there's any questions that uh, you want answered, feel free to actually post a question in either the chat or the Q&A. And what we do is once we've finished, once um, I'm just going to introduce you to Julio, uh, Julio in a second, and once he's finished, we'll actually have an open uh, leave the floor open to all of you guys and if you want to raise your hand if you'd rather actually um, chat about your experience and again we really do implore you to to join us um, if you found things hard um, if you you're now going on to remote learning due to covid especially this year I mean tutors have had it exceptionally hard with the first lockdown we'd love to hear your experience um, what I'm going to do as well I'm just going to share with you a very very small and short poll and uh, if you could just fill that out, um, it would help as well with our conversation at the end. So I'm going to introduce you to Julio. Julio, if you'd like I to give a bit of background and how you found using the tool. Absolutely. I just want to, I think, Ther Teresa Baginski, you just uh, ask us a question. What happens to the material we create now once you stop having free access? Access. Hi, Jacqueline. How are you? Uh, so the I mean, they you want to take this one with the with the course that they're creating? I think that's what Teresa is asking. Uh, yeah, what we'll do is we'll we'll come uh, to the questions after. We'll all okay, sort perfect. Those after, so. No problem at all. We'll go back. Go ahead. Uh, actually, I have. I'll be very brief because I think Rob covered the most uh, interesting part. Especially, thank you so much for showing how the tool works because I I particularly was. Um, the, yeah, I, I, I'm not very tech uh, fluid as a teacher. I come, I, my, my name is Julio, as they said. I am from Venezuela. I currently live in Barcelona, this tech background. Uh, do not get yourself be cheated. And I teach uh, French and English a second language, and I teach Spanish, which is my native language, which I've been doing it for around nine years. And I have, I, I think one of the reasons I'm, I'm thankful to, to be talking now because I've, I've used this tool both in traditional classes, which was my, my usual training, and as I think most people in this room uh, do to coronavirus in an online environment, which I struggle a lot. And I'm very curious to see if, if, if I have some supporters there. Um, so essentially, I one of the things that is particular when I started teaching is that I used to teach languages in countries where the language wasn't spoken. So, for instance, I taught uh, English and Spanish in France, and I taught Spanish and French in England. And one and and, and I, I love what Rob said about completion, about the concept of completion, because I really felt I, I've always felt even uh, to my own training that you, there's never such a thing as finishing learning a language because even when you're a native, you're still discovering, you're still developing uh, within that language. There's so many things we still don't know. There's so many things that changes and, 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 and that's the fun thing of languages and, and, and of learning them. So I, I, one of the challenges when, I, when you're teaching a language that is not really commonly spoken uh, on the country, so let's say Spanish in, in France, is that you get a very, very reduced amount of time with the students and you don't get to, you are very, very uh, reliant on the syllabus and this time to kind of explain a whole ecosystem that is much easier to learn actually when you are in the actual country, when you're learning French in France or when you're learning uh, English in whatever English speaking country you are. So I, one of the things that I've always found useful about video content is that it's a little window into that culture and it's a little window into many sub-subjects within, within a, a syllabus that you, can, you cannot really teach. You just have to show and you just have to experience. And, and that's how I had the privilege to learn a language because I was actually in the countries I was learning. But many students don't have that. And especially nowadays where we're going more and more towards on an online um, educational system, you're learning, and, and that's also a, a great uh, thing. You get to learn languages from wherever you are, and regardless of the language that's spoken. So 
I started using videos even before I found this tool um, as a way of, of showcasing the things that I thought, you know? So I, I, for me, movies and TVs were always engaged, more engaging than a textbook. And, and that was, th that I always had that very nice relationship because as, as, as they said, I come from a film background as well. Uh, when I found this tool, uh, it was it was brilliant because it allowed me to to put the two together. Especially at this point, I was doing one to one tuition or tutoring of group of twelve. So this was part of the lesson, and it was a way of not uh, putting it as an extra thing of actually adding my syllabus, I actually adding the themes that I wanted into this video content and. The result is, is great. Like the students, is, and I'm sure many people here have used video content. They, they just respond better to it, especially younger, uh, I would say 20s and 30s below. They're just so used to uh, being on the internet. They're so used to consuming content. So when you add that very, very sneakily to your, your theme, when you're teaching prepositions or when you're teaching a, a grammar subject that perhaps is a little bit more dense to understand, you are showcasing one, the actual uh, um, uh, language tool being used in a in a day to day scenario, and and two, you're doing it in a fun way and in a way that they feel like it's more of a game. Uh, so yeah, that that was a little bit my experience because I started using it when I was still teaching um, uh, with the students in class. But then COVID hit and we have to go into online mode. And that was a very, very particular challenge for me because as I said, I'm not very tech uh, fluid. Uh, luckily this, and, and, and I'm sure we've all experienced uh, now with the, these platforms of Zoom and Skype, it's, it's much more user friendly than it used to be. And, and I, I found a very nice um, uh, relation with using, let's say Zoom and this tool. So two, I mean, I'll, I'll again, Rob said cover most of the things that I wanted to, to, to say, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but what, one of the things that I think is really interesting as, as pros when you're teaching um, uh, languages with this tool is that you get to showcase slang a lot and a lot of students, and this is very particular to whoever, wh where do you student come from and what type of language you're, you're teaching, but there is quite a lot, at least of my student base, that wanted to learn it more of a touristic uh, goal. You know, they wanted to learn it because they wanted to travel to Spain and they wanted to be able to communicate. So I call that like, let's say, the soft language learning where they're not really interested. They are interested in the grammar. They need it because they want to learn the language, but they're not, they're not doing it for proficiency tests. They're not doing it for, for career. So uh, this is great because, again, it's a much more a fun and engaging way of teaching it, but also slang and dialects and common expressions are, are, are much trickier to teach. And also they change from country to country. So I'm a very big fan of, of, of incorporating this into the language, especially as, as, as a lot of people know, Spanish changes between the countries that you get, uh, that you get to teach in. And I realized that students are really curious to see how do you say, um, the, uh, this expression in Chile uh, versus how would you say in Spain? And when you play a Chilean clip or you will play a Spanish clip, it's really right there. You have the example, you know? So that's one of the pros that I wanted to talk. Um, for those teachers that do French, and I mentioned in French, I think this is relevant for all languages, but French is such a phonetic language and it's all about the pronunciation where you can literally make a mistake uh, when you mispronounce a word and, lead, and say something completely different. And actually French natives are quite uh, strong on this. Uh, so uh, one of the things that I, I found also really nice is that it, the student develops its listening skill and it's much, much, much uh, detail, especially because I am not a native uh, French speaker. So it's much easier for them to consume it from a French uh, content that was made and, and talked to by French actors or by, by any type of video. Uh, so I felt like I had a, a second assistant uh, teacher when I was well, when I was teaching anything that was related to phonetics. Um, a couple of other things, I, what Rob mentioned the the results that was very very interesting for me because you see uh, and and we don't have this when you're doing traditional classroom at least I I never managed to is to uh, self improve on, on what type of questions you're doing. And as Rob said, if when you go back to this result, because it showed in percentage, you get to know 
when and 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 we all know our students especially at least me because i have very small classes so i know them by person i know what what are they struggling with but now i also know what i'm i'm making a mistake perhaps on assessing too early what i need to reinforce as a class curriculum because everybody's failing on the same question and on the same subject and that's very interesting about the tool um and one last thing is that it's great for homework because i don't know how you guys do but every time I have these online lessons now because already this online, it means sitting down in your chair. The, if you have students that are in, in high school or in, in regular school, they've been doing it for the entire day and you are there for the extra hour. Homework is just much more fun if you sell it to them as watch this video, it has a game in it. We, if you have more than one student, they can play together, which is great. Uh, I have actually students that, that play together as a homework so they kind of connect with each other because they do have that time and 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 they 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 play and i get the, the same results and they had fun and they did it together but they'll answer individually so i get to assess them anyway so yeah those are three yeah. things that that i would suggest as a as a, an advantage an added advantage of this tool and um, yeah oh, that's perfect else? Thanks, Julio. Yeah, and um, Julio has been involved as well with the um, the actual live learning courses that we've helped with and um, that we've actually put on, and he's helped with uh, some of the questions. And again, he touched on a couple of points there. So this can be used as a homework aid, uh, remote teaching and learning aid. Uh, it's a good introduction as well to running online classes, which, which we've actually um, we which we've done ourselves just to prove the point of concept, so that people can see it being used in that way. And it's good to yeah. use it as a used way of tracking progress of learning as well. Yeah. So again, we'd like to open the floor up. Do you have any other um, language tools that you actually use? And uh, what issues have you had with them, if any? What makes them special? Um, what would you change about them? I notice we've got a couple of questions up there. Um, we've got a couple of questions, but if anyone would like us to uh, speak to them, <laughs> it's always kind of strange chatting via text. <laughs> If you, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I can't remember how to do the raise hand button, but just raise raise your hands and let's get uh, let's get get people involved. Um, anyone that does that as well, just be respectful of others, and anyone obviously not deemed as being respectful will be ejected. So please bear that well, in mind. As you've well. had some problems in the past, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Whilst we're waiting, we have got quite a few questions in here. Uh, so yeah. Theresa has asked if you can use it asynchronously or how you would, which Julio uh, just talk, talked about a little. I'm not sure if you fully answered, but one thing I kind of wanted to add to that is we have got an option that we've sort of switched off for now for the beta version where you can download a file and install it into your learning management system. If anyone knows what SCORM compliant means, <laughs> extra bonus points, but you have a SCORM compliant piece of e-learning, which means that you can put it on a learning management tool and you can see not only which students logged in, answered which questions or responded in which way to which interactions, but also um, how long they spent watching it, how much of the video they actually watched, how many times they watched it, when they watched it and all that kind of uh, rich reporting stuff. We're not planning on recreating all of that ourselves because most schools kind of have their own learning management tool of some kind. Um, so they can use that, but also for the time being, if you go to filmdo.academy and you just open the file up and no one joins with the URL and you just click play, the questions will still come up and you can just click on that one screen. Perfect. Thanks ever so much, Rob. Um, yeah, thanks for the question, Teresa. Well, again, do we have... So uh, Karen has asked, um, do I have to use the film do films or can I use uh, YouTube and Vimeo? And the answer is for the time being, you have to use YouTube and Vimeo videos. Just copy the URL from YouTube or Vimeo and, and paste it in there. We will give access to film do films and clips from film do films once we've uh, signed some legal paperwork, <laughs> that kind of thing. But also that so probably won't, won't be available in the free version because there is a, a cost for uh, watching those. Sorry. I think that's a good news for, no, I, I think that was a good news for Karen because yeah, as, as Rob said, YouTube and Vimeo, that's, that's the go-to right now. Which is, by the way, I, 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 just to mention, I'll, not a couple of, of cons, but something to, to be aware of is 
and and that's what I think is is lovely to have this conversation, and we want to hear from you how you get your content. I can see from the polls that a lot of uh, of you create your own content, and that's fantastic. Because the only challenge I could say about the tool is because it's Vimeo on YouTube is that you have to do that kind of searching. So besides preparing your class, you need to find content that is appropriate, and and it really depends on the ages and the subjects that you're teaching. So. That time, if you are creating your own content, so much easier. I am, I'm, 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 I even get nervous being in front of a camera. I, I struggle a lot when we went online because of it. But, uh, but if you are doing it, and I see most of you actually create your own uh, virtual lessons and, and co video content, fantastic. You, you just need to upload it as Rob said to YouTube and Vimeo, and you're good to go. And you can add as many questions, and you can adapt it as, as you want. Absolutely. I mentioned the poll there. I'm actually going to share the results with everyone. So um, it's uh, quite an eclectic group there. A lot of uni teachers, huh? There are actually, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's important to note as well that absolutely everyone that filled out the poll has actually converted to online classes. So, well, obviously, with the yeah. first part of this year, there was no other option. But um, to know as well, you know, the question here, if you did, what did you find difficult and would you have liked help with? And a couple of people there have selected other. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? We'd like to know uh, exactly what issues you had there. But yeah, getting and attaining students' attention, 100%. And that's what we find with the video tool that we've got. Um, it really does help with that. Uh, yeah. With, uh, keeping the students' attention. It's their natural environment to go online and watch videos. So just literally combining that with learning is perfect. I'm surprised. I thought I'd see all hands up, all everyone wanting to uh, get involved with the with the chat. Um there is some questions on the I'm I'm confused between the chat and the QA to be honest. I, I know, yeah. So uh, yeah, we've got chats uh, and okay. And feel, feel free to raise your hands. Does anyone know how to raise your hands whilst I'm saying that? I actually don't know how to do that. But, you know, if you just pop, if you just press the raise your hand button, wherever that might be, uh, we yeah. can we can take you off mute and you can uh, just ask us directly rather than us try and, try and navigate all the different chats. <laughs> um, wants yeah, to talk yeah, about yeah. their own experience. Can I? Can, uh, I'm gonna address at least I'm gonna I'm on the Q and A page, so I'm gonna just okay. answer. Uh, anonymous uh, wrote, "Films can be difficult for beginners level. How would you use films and your game for beginners? Also, how would you make the questions different between beginner, intermediate, advanced level?" That's a great question. Uh, and remember, Dave, when we started, as uh, he said, uh, doing these live events, which we hold for for almost the entire summer, and we, we did really good uh, doing these Zoom lessons for, Sp uh, for Spanish, and we started with beginners uh, as a subject. It really, the, the cool thing about the versatility of the tool, and first of all, we, so the very, very first thing when you're doing beginners is that you put subtitles in the language most of the time, especially when we did it for live, we went with English subtitles because we that's the language we were assuming people spoke, uh, or at least they knew better than Spanish. Uh, that way you can uh, assess on very small uh, sort of language things, let's say common expressions or, or maybe something vocabulary that you thought, but you're not really expecting them to understand the full content because they're beginners, you know? Um, I lost the Q&A. Oh, no, never mind, I got it. And then how you make the questions different between beginner, intermediate, and advanced, it really depends on the curriculum. Uh, as, as Rob says, you guys are from uni and I'm from public school. So it really depends on the year you guys are at, uh, what type of students, what, what is their, their learning goal with the language. So I think that's a really much more of a case by case, but for beginners, definitely just finding content that has subtitles on. Most YouTube content, I think guys, tell me if I'm wrong, has subtitles, at least has the CC caption on. So so that's not hard to do. If yeah. you are creating your own video content, you might have to add it on. Uh, I, again, I use video, Vimeo and YouTube that I don't create, so I don't have that issue, but, but yeah. Yeah, no, that's uh, great. Heidi, I love the fact that uh, you've answered your own question there. So can the uploading <laughs> of a video take a long time? She's literally using it right now because I'm answering my own <laughs> question. <laughs> no, it doesn't take a long time. It, uh, 
he comes straight straight from it. Yeah, yeah. So it's not it's not uploading the video from YouTube. It's still embedded from YouTube. We we aren't um, taking a copy of it. I think there might be some copyright issues if we did. <laughs> yeah, it works on top. Works over the top of it. So yeah, um, we've yeah. had. Uh, Karen, uh, yeah, so, uh, okay, so an issue, I think this is uh, from the question earlier from, you know, an, an other, if you like, from the answer. So there's some port from admin, frozen funds, et cetera, and lots of changes at uni, 100%. Yeah, yeah there, there's been a huge amount of changes this year. And I'm expecting the same again next year, but there, there are some funds that the universities and schools and colleges can tap into. And um, uh, we are having conversations with schools and universities in ways in which they can actually fund our tool. So if there is someone that um, you have that we can talk to at the school uni, please do email us or forward that information and we can have a conversation with them and maybe get our tool um, used inside the school or university, in your school or university. Yeah. That's that. That's I think that really applies to everybody who's working for an institution. It we and and I'm doing it the same with the tuition company I used to work on. It use it yourself first. Try it out, please, by all means. And and then if you actually like it, there is no reason why it cannot be adapted to any curriculum or any syllabus. You know what I mean? And I really put this to test with different type of students, and they they. They came from different places, and some of them were private, and some of them were were from this tuition school. And if it works, and you you prove this this admin department that that it does, and you're comfortable with, it, we are more than happy to do that conversation and and to have them try and to have other colleagues of you try. That's another thing because the tool is free. Feel free to share, uh, Karen, especially with with your your teachers and and, and fellow colleagues because. That may be, be a strong muscle to say, hey, we've all used this and it really seems to be working. Uh, if that's the case, I would say. Yeah, perfect. Um, so Rob, I, I think well, this one, because you're more at Puzzle, the, I, I currently use uh, Ed Puzzle in my class. How is your tool different from Ed Puzzle? Because I've never used Ed Puzzle. <laughs> so interestingly, we, we had never seen it before until about a year ago when <laughs> people started telling us about it, which is interesting because we've gone a, a, a similar <laughs> way. But the, the, the big obvious thing to mention first is that the whole purpose of FilmDo getting involved in this area is that FilmDo currently has one of the largest collections of uh, licensed uh, foreign language video content online. So the premium content is a big thing. A big issue is if you're gonna use the YouTube videos and we'll probably add some kind of feature that gives you an alert if this happens is you are using a video that you don't own the content to and someone can take it down at any point. <laughs> we don't really want that to be an ongoing problem for people to, to be using it. So a big thing is, is, is the content and we have some backend stuff that we haven't rolled out yet around analyzing that content to give you a much better idea about which video is best to use for uh, which class. We, we're very specifically looking at language learning rather than just adding interactions to videos. Currently, the main big difference is that they're watching it together in a classroom. It's kind of a watch party or, or watching it at home. One thing, when we very first started talking to people about learning languages with films, the biggest thing straight away was I, I don't sit at home and watch a film on my own or a short film or anything. Obviously, if you set your student homework on Edpuzzle, then they have to, but are they, are they enjoying it? That's <laughs> the question <laughs> when they're forced to. Whereas um, watching in unison, and obviously we do have a homework feature, but being able to still do the homework in unison if they want to arrange it with their friends uh, makes it more enjoyable for people. We've especially noticed a, a thing where people set a video for homework and what happens is students watch it at the very last minute before they have their next language class. <laughs> it's just actually a, a big problem I've heard from language teachers is the whole point of having homework as you do it at some point between classes to refresh your, your mind, not the second you go back in, but uh, di di different story, I suppose. And um, moving forward, the whole point is that we're also looking at different interactions we can, we can add. So currently we might just have those multiple choice questions, but we're very curious, uh, especially from you guys, is what interactions do you think are going to be most useful for learning languages we've had some crazy ideas like you could <laughs> get the students to like dub the scenes themselves and get points on how accurately they dubbed it <laughs> things like this we don't want to add it all in there yet because it makes it a bit too complicated when people use it the first time 
and there's 15 Absolutely. different interactions. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I guess that's kind of the point that we're looking at for your, you guys, you know, your feedback. The tool is free, but we, all we ask you to do is give some feedback with it. So what would you like to see on there? And like Rob says, we did have some other interactions on there, but um, the more it gets, uh, you know, kind of, I think it's starting with multiple choice and then adding on some other interactions that people definitely definitely want they're going to respond to and use is just a better use of our time and development um we've had a message from dana hello yep i'm going to put you on allow you to talk hello can you hear me dana, welcome how are hey, you hey dana nice hello. to meet you hi nice to meet you too um i think i might have a few questions but i'm trying to figure out how to phrase them um no. the first thing the first thing is i'm i'm an esl teacher um, but I'm also a regular teacher. I work with um, students from K to five here in, in New York. And so I, I have a business that I'm putting together starting and I'll be kind of teaching both aspects. And so I wanted to see um, if there's any uh, material that I could use just for regular, you know, regular students of mine, um, aside from the ESL language learning students. Like, do you have like, um, do you have like uh, content that I can use with students of that age, young children? How, how was the range of age? Um, so What's this would be like range? five to let's say up to maybe 10 years old. Yeah, we're, we're literally um, attaining content for that age range right now. Um, we what we do is we we allow people to um, find their own content using the free uh, tools such as YouTube, YouTube, sorry, and Vimeo. Mm -hmm. But we don't specifically have any on our site that you can use with this software. So you can find on your own content or even your very own content that you've created yourself. That you might have uploaded to YouTube. You can actually use our tool with that. And again. Um, we've made this tool for free. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. so uh, Dana, if you want, because as, 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 as Dave said, that's something that, that we're currently working on is to, to make that catalog a little bit more robust. For the moment, especially if you're in an emergency, we, because we did this Spanish class and I need to see for English because I don't have one at hand, but we have a small uh, pool of tutors like myself that have been working with this tool. So we are in a group chat and we can ask them around in terms of what type of YouTube and Vimeo content that is currently out there could be useful for that age. Because I don't teach that, I don't teach English for that age, so I don't really know. Uh, mm -hmm. But we can definitely reach out because we have people that are using tools with more or less that age range. It's always, I mean, because it's YouTube and Vimeo, it, it takes a little time, but it, it's not that hard from my experience, I think, uh, to, is to find a young animated and, and especially short clips. Because one of the things, at least in my experience with the tool is that short form, short films, short video content works better than a film as for the student and for the teacher because it's just less time to create the course you, you do with 10 or 12 minutes. And I think that's what they're currently focusing on with the, the films that are acquiring. So I'll, I'll, we'll definitely chat around. I think Dave has your email and we'll send okay. you some ideas. Because, yeah. And Karen, you, thank you so much for, for, for your message. I think, I don't know if she's still here. Uh, no, she left, but she left. She wanted to say that, that she wants to get uh, the University of Colorado uh, involved where she works. So we'll contact her later. Absolutely, yeah. Thank, thank you, Dana. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank thanks. You so uh, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I'll do a follow up email to everyone again. You know, uh, this isn't um, a sales pitch at all. This is just, um, just kind of giving us a bit of a platform to letting everyone know that we're here. Hello, we're here. Um, we'd like to, you to use our tool and uh, to give us some feedback. That's all we ask. So I um, think so uh, there aren't any more questions. I think there was one, one, but I think it's, it's very, it's very it's similar to the Inans. Is what age range would you recommend for students using films and games? It, if, is it only for uh, older students? I didn't need to be able to interact and play games on the phone. I, I, I'm, I'm sure we can back me up with this. I've seen five-year-olds that are much more uh, understanding of technology and cell phones right now. So I really don't think there is 
an age range. I mean, they, they need to read and write at least for, for this type of, of tool to be useful, uh, which is not the case for all, everybody's students. Some people that have even younger students, perhaps not the best way because they cannot, it's not only about the clicking, it's just they cannot read the question. Uh, but you can definitely use it with all age range. It really depends about the content you find. If you create your own content, you're good to go because you can really adapt it to your age. If not, uh, we'll, 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 uh, we'll ask around to our, our, our tutor networks because we can also give you some ideas as we are developing our, our own catalog. Excellent. Thanks, Julian. There is a support link on the site. There is a, uh, in the bottom right, there's a little uh, chat icon you can click. That's from uh, Teresa is asking if there is support link on the site. There is a, a, a chat. Um, do we have a, I assume there's a contact thing at the bottom or something. Yeah, yeah, there is. Yeah, um, yeah there there is. Is. I'm, I'm going to follow up with an email. So um, you'll be able to email me directly as well. So if there are any questions, any further questions? Or I queries. think Dana has one. Sorry to interrupt you, Dave, but uh, no, that's, that's fine. That's okay. if you can, oh, we can, I can unmute her for that. Uh, Heidi has asked if we would consider using audio clips like podcasts, and I just quickly wanted to update that. Yeah, we'd consider. <laughs> uh, we can. We will. Yeah, we yeah. will quite soon be able to use uh, SoundCloud. We're going to roll it out so you can use a whole bunch of other free content as well. So SoundCloud will come soon. I don't know if people put podcasts on SoundCloud. I'm not too sure, but if they put it up on YouTube or anything, then you can. Um, I'm curious where people listen to podcasts. If anyone wants to update where they listen to their podcasts, we uh, can see if it's technically possible for wh whichever sort of app you use for podcasts. There you go. But definitely, we've, we've had that question it. a couple of times. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, if it's popular, you know, that's something we, we would definitely um, look into. Um, they, they, I'm going to allow Dana to talk. I think she wants to. Yeah, of course. Question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just learned how to do that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Dana. You had Hi, another question? Me? Yes. Um. Well, I didn't want to like keep anyone's time because I know we're going to be ending soon. So I was going to let let it go with a a follow up email. If okay. that'd be yeah. No problem. Fine. Well, we're, we're going to be running um, webinars like this uh, and roundtables. I, I, you know, I don't like calling them webinars because um, it's an open conversation between you guys. And I, I'm certainly not the expert. These guys, Rob and Julio, have um, chewed to experience. But the people that actually join this group are the experts. And this is why we want to kind of learn a bit more about your experiences, what you found easy, hard, what you need help with or... Um, how these tools can assist you and help you and uh, and then we can obviously kind of um railroad what we're doing into exactly assisting you guys but um yeah we'll be running some more of these chats so please do sign up and again i'll be i'll be sharing the links and everything on a follow-up email with you guys so okay yeah that's great thank you because I, I do want to kind of let you know a little bit more about what i'm doing and what i need and see how you guys can help with that yeah that'd, that'd be brilliant. brilliant and you know we're still very much developing so anything that's going to help you any direction that yeah. we we, yeah. we can go and we're, we're looking for you know feedback as well so if we can thank support you, you better sure we're definitely going to do that okay yeah thanks so thanks, much sir. Thanks, Donna. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate everyone joining today. Thank you ever so much for your time. Um, we hope you enjoy our tool. Um, um, Amelia has just asked if uh, how how uh, sorry it is probably quite an important point to end on. How can they ask answer quest ask questions using the site? So I don't know if um, someone wants to point to the the. <laughs> share my screen again but if you if you look at if you go to filmdo.academy in the very bottom right of the screen there's a chat icon that's probably the best way because you're going to get uh, a reply straight away if you click on that start yeah. chatting to someone absolutely i will get back to emails but it might not be straight away especially if you're in america i'm in the uk the time difference etc so um yeah but uh, rob's absolutely right there is a, a live chat on the website but if not, again, you, know, you guys are going to be privileged to have my <laughs> direct email address. So I will answer any questions or find the answers to any questions that uh, you guys post to me. 
So thank you again for your time. Um, and thank you, and Heidi, thank for the you. podcast recommendation because she gave she gave a couple of them, Rob. Uh, okay. On the Q &A. Oh, oh, thank you. Oh, 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 we can review that. Yeah, totally. I, yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, Anna. Brilliant. Well, thank you ever so much. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate you. that. Great presentation, Rob. Thank you. Good stuff. I thought Thank I'd get you. some people disagree with me. I thought we'd get some arguments started. I was ready for... Didn't have, didn't have any arguments. Didn't have any arguments. Yeah. You're asking for an argument, you didn't have one. If I'm honest, this being the first round table thing I've been to, I thought it was more like an open discussion about education and things. I was trying to get some provocative ideas out there. I didn't realise it was purely questions about <laughs> what we can do, but that's that's fine too. Well, this is our first webinar, so we'll be hosting yeah. and running you some more. You guys are lucky. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, when it all started, we'll be refining it. <laughs> Thanks ever so much. Take care. Thank Have a lovely evening. Bye, all. Bye bye.